There we go. Okay. So we will, like I said, be talking about animal headgear today. Um, my name is Monica McCoubrey. I'm the Wildlife Education Specialist. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to use that chat box and I will get to you as soon as I can. All right, so what are we talking about when we talk about animal headgear? Um, this is basically anything that's gonna be on the animal's head. So this is gonna be antlers, horns. Um, sometimes we hear things like feathery gills or external gills or outside gills. Um, we're gonna be talking about crests and crowns, antenna, um, hoods on animals. So these are just a few of the things out there. Um, again, we only have so much time and I wanna cover as much as I can in these uh, short series that we have time for. So um, we're gonna cover a few of these today. Um, talk Talking about different things that animals have on their heads. So when we talk about those um, things that animals have on their heads, they're for a purpose. Um, not necessarily are they just there to look pretty or to um, hang Christmas ornaments on or anything like that. We are definitely, um, animals have those things so that they can survive or that they can survive better in their environment. So we'll be talking about what animals have what, um, what's the difference between some of them, and why those animals have those things. So we're gonna start with one that everyone kind of knows. Um, you might know a little bit about them, but um, you might not have that full backstory. So we're gonna talk about antlers first. So um, I do have a funny story. When I was doing a program one time, we were talking about antlers. Um, I think a three, uh, third grader um, came up to me and said, why, why do deer have antlers? And I said, well, what do you, what do you think they do with them? And he kind of looked and he thought for a while and. He, he came up with this awesome idea that deer need to pop bubbles. Like if you've ever blown bubbles, that was the reason that deer had antlers. And it totally made sense. They're sharp, they're able to pop bubbles, but not quite the reason that they have them. But it was a really, really good story and I always like sharing that. So, um, so what are antlers when we talk about those? So there's a few different animals out there that have antlers. Um, mostly in North America, we're gonna be looking at things like white-tailed deer, mule deer, moose, caribou, elk. Um, if you're familiar with the species that we have just here in Nebraska, those are going to be things like elk, mule deer, white-tailed deer. We don't have caribou and every once in a while we have a stray moose that does come into Nebraska, um, but they are not a common species that we see too often. So um, usually when we talk about antlers, um, all of those animals that have them within those species, mostly those are the adult males that have the antlers. Um, We'll talk about why that is here in a little bit, um, but they all also belong to what's called the cervidae family. So that is the deer family. Um, what's really interesting, and I didn't know this about antlers, is they are one of the fastest growing animal tissues on the planet. Um, they can actually grow up to about an inch a day. So if you look at your finger, a great way to kind of put this into perspective is if you look from your knuckle to your knuckle, that's about an inch, give or take, um, but that's how much they can grow every single day. So that's really neat in my opinion. So um, antlers are also made of bone. So a lot of people when they talk about antlers, they also kind of use the word horns and they kind of use those words interchangeably, but they are extremely different um, beasts when we talk about those. So again, we'll get to horns later today, um, but right now we're gonna talk just about antlers. And if you've ever touched antlers, they are hard, they are made of bone. So a little bit different than an actual horn. All right, so why do animals have antlers? Well, scientists kind of believe that they evolved over time um, basically to facilitate competition um, between males for the girls. So if you read that Journal Star article, I did get asked why do deer have antlers and short to get the girl. That is exactly why they have them. Um, they need to defend their territory. They need to show the females that they are worthy and strong. So they have antlers um, to show those females that they're, they're pretty cool and they're hot stuff. Um, they are also used for self-defense. There's a lot of predators out there. Um, for instance, mountain lions are a very big predator of deer, um, even in Nebraska. And another reason that they have those antlers is for protection, um, but they also assert their dominance through them. Um, so a lot of the times they use them even with the same species. So you might see two deer, two elk, um, two moose sometimes going at it, both males. Um, they're showing each other who's boss and they're trying to compete um, mostly for food or even for women as well, girls as well. Um, females also tend to mate with the males that have the largest antlers. So um, size matters when it comes to antlers. 
antlers because that shows that that male has really good genes. It shows that he can grow and carry these huge antlers um, and that means that that animal has really good genes. They're healthy and that female wants to mate with them so that her offspring can also be healthy and strong. So um, there's a lot of different things that we talk about but definitely for food to establish dominance to get the girl um, and to have future offspring. So antlers are super important when it comes to um, surviving and thriving in their environment. All right, so when we look at antlers, what are all these things on them? Why do they grow like that? Um, so when we look at an antler, if you look at this picture that I have here, something called the pedestal, um, which is on the animal, it's where the antlers grow out of. So I don't know if you can see my mouse here, um, but this area right here, it's where the antler basically comes out of their head. Um, so this bone tissue um, begins to grow from that area. And um, you will notice in this picture, they almost look soft. They don't look like hard bone. Well, they absolutely are. That stuff is called velvet. So if you've ever seen deer with this fuzzy stuff on them, we call that velvet. So the velvet will actually help blood and nutrients flow to the growing bone. So just like our bones, they have nutrients, they have blood flowing through them to get to the rest of the body. Same thing with antlers. So um, during this time when they have that velvet on them, they're extremely fragile. Um, they can break very easily and they're almost like a spongy texture. They're not this hard, um, you know, stereotypical type of antler that we think of. Um, so I actually have some antlers to show you. Hopefully everyone can see that. This is a very small one, um, probably would not get a lot of girls, but um, this is what it looks like. Um, this is a hard part um, of the bone. This one does not have velvet on it, um, but here's where the antler attached to the head of the animal, and then over time it grew. Um, so, um, they will continue to grow and one thing about antlers versus horns is that antlers branch. So you will notice there's lots of different little tines off of this main piece here. Um, so over time that velvet will actually, um, then that spongy part will compartmentalize and harden into that hard bone like you see here. All right, so when the antlers reach their full size, the blood um, to the velvet will actually be cut off and that um, the antler will basically die. Um, so it is something that will fall off every year and regrow. Um, so at this point, especially now um, in this fall coming time is when the deer are starting to get their full rack of antlers or the elk are starting to get them or moose or whoever we're talking about. So the deer will scratch off the velvet. A lot of times you will, um, if you hunt or if you um, hike a Lot, you will notice some trees that have some markings on them. A lot of times that is deer scratching their antlers. So when their velvet is coming off, when it's dying, it's extremely itchy. Um, and so the one thing they want to do is they want to get that velvet off. So they will scratch um, on trees, shrubs, anything they can find to get that velvet off of their, their antlers. Um, it's also not unusual to see a lot of blood during that time. Um, if you want to, you can go ahead and Google. I don't have a picture of it today, but you can Google search what it looks like. Um, it's bloody, like stuff is hanging off of them. The velvet is hanging off. Um, that is just them scratching off that velvet. And a lot of times that blood flow just stops. So um, it does look kind of gross, but it's just something that has to happen. So a lot of people wonder when antlers grow. Um, they do grow differently every single time. They're very unique to that animal. Um, but scientists are actually finding that there is a memory confirmation um, when they do grow. So it is similar if the deer have a non-symmetrical rack, um, they will grow another non-symmetrical rack. If they are very large, they'll grow very large antlers again. Um, they will grow similar directions of time. So even though they are different and they are unique every year, um, deer, elk, whatever has the antlers, there is some sort of memory in that bone and they know how to grow and which way to grow and how large to grow. So that's also really interesting, I think. All right, so after the breeding season, when the antlers are shed, maybe you have even found a shed before. That is, I think, really fun to find them. Um, this occurs and they will break off because of these things called osteoclasts. They break down the bone where the antler, so right here, where the antler meets the head and they will just literally fall off. They're very fragile, they're weak, they're not attached anymore and they will fall off. That's why a lot of the times in the spring, they usually say around tax day, April 15th, um, that that is a great time to find those because that is 
at the time where all these deer um, have lost their antlers. So a very good time to find shed. Um, shortly after they lose them, they will start to grow a new set back. And um, about the um, fall time, they will have their brand new rack. So coming up here for deer season um, and archery season um, in November, excuse me, um, is when the full racks will be up because that is the time that the males are trying to find the females. So that is going to be their biggest, prettiest antler rack that they have. All right, um, so we're going to talk about horns. I do have a cool, let's see if I can figure this out with the thing down here. I do have a cool thing that I'm going to do with you guys. Um, polls. All right. Really quickly, I would love to know if you guys think, are horns and antlers the same thing? Let's see if you've been listening. If you want to go ahead and uh, click the polls here. Yes, duh, they are the same thing. No, or I don't know. That's why I'm on this webinar. I see a lot of no's. Good listeners. Good listeners. 18, 20, 27. All right. Almost everyone got it. Perfect. So no, they are not the same thing. I'm so glad you, all of you were listening. All right. Let's go back to the screen here. Come on. All right. So good. I'm glad you guys were listening. Horns and antlers are not the same thing. Even though a lot of people use them interchangeably, that's not right. All right, so what are horns? So horns are gonna be very different structurally, physically, they're gonna look different. They're gonna be different colors. Um, so horns are going, they're not, um, they don't fall off every year. Horns are permanent. They're not made of bone. Um, so they're found in things like antelope, cattle, goat, goat sheep, um, a lot of members of what we call the bovidae family, so like cows. Um, most of the time, um, unlike antlers, males and females can have horns. Not in every single species. Um, in every single species, they might have them, but they might be different sizes. Um, if you guys can guess, what do you think? Males or females are going to have the bigger horns? probably going to be the males, right? Males are going to have thicker horns, they're going to be longer, they're going to be prettier, they're going to be sharper. Um, females, they're not all going to be the same. They could be smaller, they could be a different color, they could be shorter, they could be thinner, um, but they can have both species and both genders can have um, horns, which is kind of neat. So horns, they consist of a bony core covered by a, what's called a keratin sheath. So you might have heard the word keratin before. If you haven't, you guys have it on your body too. It's your hair, it's your fingernails, it's your toenails. So it's the exact same stuff that makes up those things. So for you guys, I have a pronghorn skull here. So pronghorn are a little different, we'll talk about them. But when we talk about, oh, that was gross. So when we talk about this, there is that bony core covered by a keratin sheath. And I wish you could see the dust that just came out of this, but I won't show that to you. So, um, so this is your keratin core. So this stuff is made of the same thing as your fingernails. All right. Oh, gross. Okay. All right, so horn. So that core of a horn is actually live bone. Um, so unlike the dead bone of a fully grown deer antler. So when we look at a horn, like in a bighorn sheep, they actually do not branch like antlers do. They usually curl or spiral, but they don't branch off like the tines on a deer antler. They can be crate, they can be uh, straight, curved, spiral. There's lots of different textures and lots of different shapes that they can be. Um, and one thing that's really neat is that um, they are not born with their horns. Um, that's probably good for the mothers, but they are not going to be born with their horns. They usually start to grow them at about a month old, um, and they will grow throughout the lifetime of the animal. All right, so what happens if a horn breaks off? Um, well, they don't grow back. So unfortunately, if they are really close to where they attach to their head, they will um, just not grow or they will just, um, wherever they break off, that is as far as they will grow. Um, so broken horns will bleed because they are live bone. Unlike the um, antlers, when they fall off, they don't bleed. Um, so like we talked about, males will usually have those thicker horns. They use them for fighting and to compete with those females. Um, however, females will also use their horns. They can be extremely aggressive as especially if a predator comes up to their young um, or if they feel threatened um, or their family members are threatened, they know to use them as well. So females and males can have horns and they use them for somewhat of the same reason sometimes. 
All right. Pronghorn. So that's the one that I just showed you. We have these out in western Nebraska. Sometimes people call them antelopes. That's not right. They are pronghorns. Antelopes are a totally different category of families. Um, so these guys, what's neat is that their closest relative is a giraffe and something called the okapi. Um, if you go to the Omaha Zoo, they kind of look like a, a mismatch of a bunch of animals together. So they are the only living member of the family, the Antilocapridae family. So they are the only one that we have in Nebraska, and they are the, also Nebraska's fastest land animal, which is neat. Um, so their horns are somewhat of a blend between a cow horn and the deer antlers. You guys remember I said that horns usually do not branch. If you look at that picture, there are tiny little branches. So just like in everything in the animal kingdom, there's always exceptions to the rule. This is one of those exceptions. So just like I showed you that keratin sheath, they will actually lose that every year and they will regrow that, but the bone itself never changes. All right. So we're gonna get off on a little tangent here, but people always ask, well, what about rhinos? They have horns. Yes, they're a little different. Rhinos are actually closely related to horses. Um, they, therefore, they do not have what we call a true horn. True horn would be like on a bull or on a cow. Um, so rhino horns do not grow out of the same part of the head. If you've ever seen a rhino with a horn on its head, it's not a rhino. So bovids, like our cows, um, they grow from the top of the head by the ears rhinos, they actually grow just above the nose. So if you look at this picture, they're in a very different location than um, even a pronghorn or a bighorn sheep. So they are almost comprised of entirely that keratin protein. So that keratin, remember your fingernails, um, so there's actually no bone in the horn itself. Um, they also have kind of a lightly raised area um, and they can sharpen, they can change the form. It would just be like if you took a nail file and nail filed your fingernails down. Um, some rhinos, if you notice, will have super sharp horns. Some rhinos will have super dull, but really thick horns. Um, it's kind of up to the animal what, what they want. They can actually shape their horns by rubbing them on different things. Um, a lot of the times we hear about rhino poachers and um, poachers taking those horns. Um, they actually can grow back if it's cut off, just like your fingernail. It can grow back if it's cut off. It just takes kind of a long time. So, All right, what about giraffes? Again, we don't have giraffes in Nebraska, but they do have somewhat horns. So as we know, giraffes are not cows, um, but they do have a pair um, of horns. Um, these are called ossicones. Um, they actually begin as cartilage. Um, so when the giraffe is young, um, they are born with them. They're covered in skin. And then as they get older, they will ossify or harden into what we see in this photo now. Um, all giraffes will have them. Um, females will have them as well. And males can actually sometimes even grow two sets depending on the species. All right, I know those aren't Nebraska animals, but it was kind of cool to, to learn about those as well. All right, so moving on to the off horns and antlers here, we're gonna talk about external gills. So if you're not familiar what gills are, um, they, a lot of fish, well, almost all fish, um, and amphibians have them and they breathe using these gills. Sometimes for the life of the animal, sometimes only for a short period. So like the name implies, external means are they on the outside of the body and not within the wall. If you've ever caught a fish, you will notice that the gills are inside the fish. However, some animals like this animal, this creature that I have here, which actually is a barred tiger salamander, what we call an eft or the larva stage um, of a salamander, they have these big feathery gills that they use to breathe in the water. So before they go through metamorphosis, or that fancy word for change, before they lose their um, kind of their body shape and they become more salamander-like, um, they will have these things called feathery gills. Um, so a lot of the times they will move them around or the water currents will take them. That's just all their gills grabbing that oxygen from the water so that they can breathe. Um, if you've ever heard of something called an axolotl, we don't have them here in Nebraska, but a lot of people have them as pets. Um, they look like this their entire life. They never actually go through metamorphosis and they have those feathery gills for the life of the animal. They're not necessarily what we call headgear, but they're close enough and I wanted to include them. Um, so most species will go through that metamorphosis where, for instance, a salamander, which I just happen to have with me today. 
This was a brand new salamander we just got him about a month ago. He does not have a name. If you have a great name, I'd love to hear it. Go ahead and put it in the chat box. Um, so I think all of you can see here, if I hold him up, here is our salamander. He does not have those feathery gills. So he has gone through metamorphosis and he has lungs now. So he can breathe. Um, right now he is not in the water and he can breathe out of the water. And even when he goes in the water, he will still need to come up and breathe air using his lungs. All right. So like I said, some species like this axolotl will keep their gills throughout their entire life. Um, some species will not, like our tiger salamander. This is something you can find right here in Nebraska. This guy's from the Valentine area. All right. All right, we're moving on to what we call crowns or crests. So if anyone wants to guess what kind of animals have crowns or crests, I'd love to hear. Go ahead and put it in the chat box. We are talking about birds when we talk about this. So what exactly are crowns? When we talk about crowns, we usually think kings. It's very um, high priority and important and they're the, on the top of their head, they're the tallest part of their body. So it's the first thing that you see. Um, very similar to a lot of birds that we have here in Nebraska. It is not a full hood because if you think about when you put your hood on, um, if it's raining or something, it covers almost your entire head, your neck, everything. So crowns are at the very, very top of your head. Um, some birds, they are extremely noticeable, like this blue jay that I have a picture of here. Um, other birds, it's kind of hard to tell if they have one or not. They're not as uh, noticeable. Um, so a lot of times, if they're not as noticeable, they will have bright stripes or markings or something on there um, to let people know that they are crowned or they're crested. This is a great example. Again, I know we don't have cockatoos in Nebraska, but this is a great example of one that has them. So just depending on the species, some birds will have the crown close to the front, like this blue jay, or close to the back, like this cockatoo here. Um, some species of birds have the ability to move the muscles and the feathers that are around those, um, those areas up and down. Um, a great example, this blue jay can do that. If you Google search blue jay, you will see some where they're down, some where they're up. I tried to find one where they were up, but you can see that they actually can move and manipulate those crowns. Um, a lot of the times they will do this for things like territorial defenses, courtship displays, sometimes aggression. Um, if they're vying for the same female, um, they will try to make themselves look bigger and the best person in town. So they will move their crests and their crowns up and down. All right, um, some of the animals that you might have heard, this is called a crowned crane. Again, we do not have this in Nebraska, but this was too good of an example to pass up. Um, so this one obviously is very noticeable. You can see this one. Um, those are actually feathers. A lot of people think that they're little hairs. Well, birds don't have hairs, they have feathers. So they're just a specialized type of feather that is on their head. Um, they have colors, stripes, spots a lot of the times. Um, a lot of animals will actually have the name like a crested something or a crowned crane. Um, that means that their, their tops of their head are actually very noticeable. Um, these are great for actually if you're identifying birds and you're not sure of a bird, that's one of the first things that people usually notice is that crest or that crown on their head. All right, and one more poll for you guys here. Let me uh, stop sharing my screen and get this last one here. All right, how many different types of antenna, we're going to talk about antenna now like on insects, how many different types of antenna do you think there are? Three, five, seven, ten, fifteen, a hundred, get a good guess. All right, I'm seeing 7, 10, 100, 5, 3, almost everyone. Oh, looks about like 100 had the best. Yeah, all right. So 36% of you said 100. All right. Let me quick share screen here. All right. So antenna, mostly we're going to talk about insect antenna here. So what are antenna? And I will get to the question that I asked you here in a little bit. So don't fret. Just kind of think about your answer. So insect antenna, they're organs that help the animal uh, feel and smell in their environment. Um, many insects actually have great eyesight. People do not give them enough credit. Um, for instance, like a dragonfly, they're a predatory insect and they can grab mosquitoes right out of the air. They have amazing eyesight, but they also need antenna for their other senses. Um, they can use antenna to smell different chemicals in the air um, called chemoreceptors. 
um, that are located in their antenna. So those organs can detect lots of different things. They're like barometers. They can detect humidity, the sugar levels in the food that they want to eat. They can smell scat, like if you're a dung beetle, um, alarm chemicals. So all of those pheromones and those chemical smells, that is what antenna kind of pick up. Um, so other insects, um, they use antenna to find a mate. And the best example that I can think of is a moth. If you've ever seen a moth with these really cool fuzzy antennas, they're males. Um, males are going to have, again, the thicker antenna, just like horns in, um, in sheep. Um, but they use those to smell the females. So females will let out this really cool smell called a pheromone. Um, and the males will be able to smell that using those antennas from sometimes two miles away. If you're a little tiny moth two miles away, that's really impressive. Um, so a good example is those moths. So they use those antenna um, to increase the surface area so that they can smell um, and to catch that smell. All right, so antenna anatomy. So when I talk about this, what am I talking about? So when you look at an antenna, no matter what it looks like, they have three main parts. One is called the scape. So if you look in that picture, those blue colored images, those blue sections, those are all scapes. So that is where it attaches to the head of the insect. And what's neat is that they can rotate them. So if you all like rotate your arm in your socket, similar concept. They can rotate their antenna um, using that thing called a scape. What's next is called the pedicel. That sounds familiar. We talked about that when we talked about antlers. Same thing. Um, pedicel contains what's called the Johnson's organ. Um, this helps detect movement of the antenna and also sometimes sounds depending on the type of insect. And then the third one is called the flagellum. So um, many of these several segments have what's called flagellomeres, and they can move individually from each other. So again, depending on the type of antenna that they have and the type of species and what they're using them for, um, but they all do have those similar anatomy functions. All right, so for those of you that uh, guessed on that poll, the correct answer is 10. So 10 different types of insect antenna. Um, so I challenge you here within the next couple months before, well, hopefully more than two months before we have snow, um, I challenge you guys to go look for different insects and specifically look at their antenna. Um, for instance, a longhorn beetle, a milkweed beetle, they have extremely long antenna, but if you looked, they're clubbed. They're each individual sections. If you look closely at an ant, they have jointed antenna, so they're actually like bent. They almost look like they're bent. Um, grasshoppers have very long antenna or thread-like antenna. Moths have those feathery looking antennas. So there's lots of different types of antennas, and again, depending on the species and what they're needing them for is the reason why they're going to look the way that they do. All right, one last one here. We're going to talk about hoods. So not like the hoodie that you put up. Um, a lot of people are probably thinking, what animal has hood in Nebraska? Um, well, it's clearly the cobra. Just kidding, we don't have cobras in Nebraska, um, but that is a great example of a hood. And we do actually have a couple species in Nebraska that can do a similar function um, to um, the cobra. So. So like other animals, when snakes get scared, they want to make themselves look bigger um, to deter predators from messing with them. So one way they do this sometimes is, uh, for instance, bull snakes, they'll make a lot of sound. Rattlesnakes are going to rattle their tail. Um, or they could flatten their body to make them look bigger than they actually are. Um, so the three kind of big main species that will do this are hog noses. And here in Nebraska, we have an eastern and a western hog nose. We also have something called cobras. Again, not here in Nebraska, but in the world. And then there's something called false water cobras. So um, all of these animals have that kind of extra skin um, around their ribs to make them kind of um, blow up and have a hood around their head. Uh, snakes will also sometimes do this, and when you notice it, and you can kind of see it in the picture, they have some really cool scales and colors on their scales to even confuse animals more. Um, sometimes when they um, move their ribs and those scales are showing and their skin is showing, you can see a lot of bright colors and um, patterns on there as well. All right, so um, 
So for cobras, to display their hoods, they will actually extend their neck and elongate their ribs around the loose skin on their head. Um, they a lot of times will rise up on the front of their body and they spread their skin so it kind of looks like a hood. Again, this is to make them look scarier. It's to make other predators leave them alone. There's lots of different reasons that they do this, but mostly because they feel threatened or they're in danger. So in Nebraska, we have a couple different animals that do the similar thing, not as pronounced, but it does happen. Um, I couldn't find a picture that we have in Nebraska doing it, but I did find an awesome picture of an Eastern hognose snake um, in Texas that has um, from their Facebook page that was doing it. So if you ever see something called an Eastern hognose snake or a Western hognose snake, that is what they will look like when they are scared. They will actually blow up their um, hood around their ribs. Um, so they look similar to a cobra. Uh, sometimes people will call them um, spreading adders, um, which is totally wrong, but whatever. Um, that is just what they're called. And I do actually have a friend to show you today. Um, it's not a cobra, sorry but it is a Western hognose snake. So a little different than the one in the picture here. A um, little bit different colored. Hopefully he didn't get out. Here we go. All right, so I'll try to hold him up to the camera here so you guys can see him. So this is called a Western hognose snake um, and he probably won't do it for me because I've never seen him do it. Um, but if he does get scared enough, they will actually blow up um, their area around their hood or around their head and make it look like a hood, like a cobra. Um, if that does not work, one thing that these guys will do is they will roll over and play dead, just like a possum. Um, if that still doesn't work, they will actually defecate and um, throw up everywhere. So the last thing that any animal wants is to eat something that smells like poop and throw up. And so um, the, usually the predator will leave that animal alone. So there's lots of defenses that this animal can do. But again, one of the cool things that they have been known to do is spread their hoods, kind of like a cobra. So sometimes you might hear of people seeing spreading adders or cobras in Nebraska. Not true, but it's just the western hognose or the eastern hognose. All right, so that is the end of my webinar this week. Um, it was a little bit shorter, but um, first one, we wanted to make sure that everyone could attend and it wasn't just too much information thrown at you. So um, what we're doing next week is um, similar, same time, Thursday, September 10th from 3 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. We are gonna be looking at the science of fossorial animals. So that's kind of a word that a lot of people don't use or maybe you don't know what it is. This is gonna be underground animals. So animals that either live underground or um, why they live underground, what cool characteristics that they have that make them built for a life underground. Um, we're going to talk about all that stuff next week, same time, 3 to 4 p.m. Um, if you are interested, this is a whole eight week series um, with a bye week in there because we got to have one. Um, but um, we're going to do fossorial animals. We're going to talk about dangerous plants. I am super excited for this one. We're going to talk about not just dangerous plants, but plants that you have, that we have here in Nebraska in your backyard and what, what happens if you touch them or what can happen if an animal eats them. Lots of different things and a lot of people don't talk about plants. Uh, we're also going to talk about invasive species, um, diseases, fungi, snakes, and then for my last one, I'm actually going to have our aquatic education specialist join us and we're going to do a a co-webinar uh, here about Nebraska fish. So kind of talking about not necessarily game species, but some cool characteristics of some cool water stream fish and some fish that we have maybe in the rivers and the cool adaptations that they have. So really excited about that one. But otherwise, that is all that I have. Um, if you guys are interested, I am going to stop sharing my screen here. And I am going to check the chat box, but I'm wondering if anyone has any questions. Let me check here. You guys might have certainly had some in here and I just totally missed them. I don't see any questions. If you guys do have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat box. I will actually not unmute anybody. We've had some issues before, so we will just go ahead and use the chat box. How about reindeer? Ooh, good question. Um, we just don't have reindeer in Nebraska. Um, obviously, we don't um, have a lot of caribou either, um, but I just kind of chose some answers. But yes, um, if anyone wants to guess, reindeer, they have antlers as well. Eyebrows? Eyebrows on a puffin are what sort of headgear? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. 
Um, someone, uh, someone asked if that was a adult hognose snake. Um, sort of. He's like four years old. His name is Dexter and uh, not quite full grown yet. Um, some people will will argue this or not, but they kind of scientists have come to conclude that they have what's called indeterminate growth. So they grow throughout their life. It just kind of slows down after a while, but some argue that they don't, some argue that they do. That's what we're going to go with. So yes, kind of full grown, but no, kind of not. Good question. Um, your hognose snake full size. How do you register for this series? All right, so um, depending on where you found this, whether it was in the Lincoln Journal Star, it was on a press release, um, in a listserv email, however you find it, um, what you can do is do a couple different ways. Um, you can either go to the Nebraska Game and Parks online calendar and you can find the date and the topic that you want to register for. If you click on it, it will take you to another page. And if you click contact info or event um, website info, it will be on there. There's, it's on there three places. You, you can't miss it. And then if you hit that link, it'll say register your first name, last name, and your email. And then once you are registered, you can get a confirmation email that says, on this day, on this time, please use this link to join the meeting. If you have any problems or questions, go ahead and email me. I will go ahead and put my name in the chat box here or my email in the chat. And if you guys have any questions, um, please let me know. All right. And again, if you um, want to view this again, or if you uh, knew someone that wasn't able to be here today, you can go to our page, outdoornebraska.gov slash online education. And it is under the nature videos tab. I probably won't get it up today, but it should be up um, at the latest tomorrow afternoon. So again, if you want to watch this again or share it with somebody, it is all online for them to see. So, all right. I think, I don't see any more questions. I do not have a, U I, I mean, I do have a YouTube account, but not like a game and we have a game and parks one, but um, I'm not sure if those are on there. Good question. What about tusks? Oh, good job. Yeah. Um, there's lots of stuff we could have talked about. And again, this is just a small, short series. And I like to keep it shorter because I know people kind of lose um, attention spans after a while. And I do too. So, um, but yeah, that's a really good question about tusks. Um, things like elephants obviously have them. We could talk about walrus, walruses having them as well. Um, so please feel free to look that information up. Or if you have any questions, I can always look that up for you as well. So. Um, do you need to register for each session separately? Yes, good question. Each webinar will have its own special link. So once you register for one, that does not mean you're registered for the rest of them. You have to actually go into each individual one um, and, and uh, register that way. Good question. I also will let you guys know um, that um, I will be sending, and if you would please, if you can, if you have a couple minutes, I'll be sending each one of you guys that was registered with the email that you registered with a quick online evaluation form. So kind of just asking you, did you learn anything? Was this a waste of your time? What was your favorite part? Um, is there any topics that you guys would like covered? Um, that kind of stuff. So if you have a few minutes, I would love it if you guys could answer that. I'll try and send that out by the time um, by the end of the day today or if not tomorrow morning. So if you have a few minutes, I would love to um, be able to do that. Um, what is the name of the snake? His um, Western hognose snake and his name was Dexter, if you wanted to know. Um, that looks like the one, the cobra from Texas. Uh, it's a little bit different. The one in the uh, Facebook photo that I showed on the PowerPoint was called an Eastern hognose snake. So we have both of them in Nebraska. The Western hognose snake is obviously more Western Nebraska and the Eastern hognose snake is in the Eastern part of the state. All right. Either the hognose snake native to the Lincoln area. Um, there's been a few records of a Western and an Eastern in uh, Lancaster County, um, but I'm, they're not something that you would find um, crazy commonly, if that makes sense. Um, Eastern hognoses are, they really like the sandy soil along like rivers or reservoirs, that kind of thing. And Western hognoses like the Sandhill area, that's kind of their, their main area. So um, there's been records of them, but that's not an established population. Um, 
All right. Yes, someone mentioned only do only female antlers have around Christmas antlers have around Christmas. Yeah, this is uh, kind of something that I learned a few years ago. So the Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer song. That's totally inaccurate. Those are all female names. Um, so uh, by that time, males have already lost their antlers. So when we say like Donner, Blitzen, Rudolph, yeah, that's wrong. They should they're females. It's kind of neat. If you ever um, want a cool story to read or a cool myth uh, ology thing to read, go ahead and look that up. But yes, that is, um, thank you, Carol, for bringing that up. That's, it's, it's really neat to hear. So will this series be available online for later viewing? Yes, um, I will put that in the chat again um, for you guys, but it is just outdoornebraska.gov slash online education. And I can't find it, so I'm just going to type it in here again make sure everyone gets that. It is this outdoornebraska.gov slash online online education. And again, it's under the nature videos tab. All right. So when do female reindeer drop their antlers? I, that's a good question. I am not sure. Um, I can obviously look that up to you for you, Judy, and get back to you. Otherwise, um, feel free to do a Google search as well, because I am I'm good, but I'm not that good. So, but thank you. That's a good question. All right. If you guys have any more questions, again, please put them in the chat. I'll hang around for a couple minutes. But otherwise, that's all I got for you guys. And please join us next week, same time, 3 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. We're going to talk about underground or fossorial animals. And um, I might have some friends joining me. Who knows? We'll see. So thank you again, everyone, for joining me and hope you learned something. Again, please watch out for that evaluation. And if you want to view them online, they are there. Thank you, guys. All right. If there's no more questions. I'm not going to unmute anybody. So if you do have questions, please type them in the chat. So I actually can't unmute you guys. So see you next week, everyone. Thank you. All right.